Kia ora. Welcome to Pause for Thought. This week we're talking to the Green Party Animal Welfare Spokesperson about why the Greens are the only party to have someone to speak out on animal welfare issues. We'll also look at what to do when you find an injured wild bird. What are the best steps to take to ensure the bird survives? The Greens are the only New Zealand political party to have an animal welfare spokesperson. That's a pretty good indication of the low priority given to animal welfare issues by most New Zealand political parties and governments. Animals are generally seen as pets or the source of export wealth but not regarded as independent living beings with any rights of their own. The Greens have detailed animal welfare policies and a spokesperson to advocate them. Now, to talk more about animal welfare and politics, I'm joined by the Greens Animal Welfare Spokesperson, Mojo Mathers. Kia ora Mojo, welcome to the programme. Hi. The Greens have an animal welfare spokesperson. Why does your party have an animal welfare spokesperson? We have an animal welfare spokesperson because at the moment we have a situation in New Zealand whereby there are millions of animals in factory farming and so on who are um, appalling, living lives in appalling conditions. Um, our reputation as a country and our own economic prosperity is built on the back of um, animal products and we believe they deserve a better deal. Mm -hmm. and they work really hard for us and the only way that we can ensure that they have a better deal, that they live good lives, is to have, for them to have their own spokesperson in Parliament. And, and we personally are, think it's a shame that the other parties don't have a separate independent spokesperson for animals. Um, animals don't have their own political voice in Parliament, they deserve a better deal. Mm -hmm. and so we, we want to do the right thing by them. So I think I know the answer to the next question. Do you think New Zealand laws adequately protect animals? Absolutely not. Um, the biggest problem is that the current animal welfare law has too many loopholes mm. in it that allow animals to be kept in conditions that reach the provisions of the Animal Welfare Act and essentially cruel and it allows suffering throughout the whole life for, the, for economic gain and we do not consider that to be acceptable. Um, so no, the Animal Welfare Act does not provide adequate protection for animals. The Act's being reviewed this year. What changes would you like to see come out of that review? Well, the review has actually been completed and there is now a bill before Parliament. It's yet to have its first reading in Parliament though. And um, some of the provisions in the bill are good. Um, there is increased provision for enforcement, um, which is long overdue. Mm -hmm. However, the biggest problem is that it still retains the loopholes that allow animals to be kept in conditions that are in breach of the main provisions of the Act. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we will, it will allow animal suffering to continue, especially on factory farms. They still allow for animals to be kept in cruel cages and so on. Mm -hmm. And so, we, the main thing that we would like to see is a removal of the loopholes that allows for um, basically the regulation to uh, provide for ongoing breaches of the Act indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's acceptable to have a phase-in period. We would like to see a phase-in period of five years by which all practices that breach the Act are phased out. Mm -hmm. But it's not acceptable for these provisions to be renewed indefinitely. Mm -hmm. And so that is the single thing that we would like to biggest change that we would like to see in the Act. Mm. The other um, big problem with the Act that has proposal that has come back is that the, there is um, allows for practicality and economic consideration to be um, uh, 
take it into account mm -hmm. when developing um, regulations in codes of welfare. And we don't think that that is necessary or appropriate. Again, it allows another big loophole by which um, the um, economic exploitation of animals is placed ahead of the well-being and fundamental right to a decent quality of life. Mm. Because the practicality and the economic considerations in practice seem to get higher priority than animal welfare does. That's right, very much so. That's certainly been the case in the past. And although um, the, they say that they're second tier consideration, mm -hmm. um, um, our concern is that there is still a law for regulation that breaks the provisions, main mm. provisions of the Act. Mm. So, um, but the biggest one is not to have an exemption, um, indefinite exemption. And yeah, there are other things that we would like to see. We'd like to see um, a stronger uh, provisions around animal testing. Um, there's no need for animal testing of cosmetics. There's no need to allow animal testing of recreational drugs. And so we would like to see strong clauses in the bill that prohibit the testing of, uh, for these purposes. Mm. And greater transparency as well around animal testing. And, um, yeah. Would you support a declaration of sentience in law? Um, the, the bill does, and we would de we definitely support that. I mean, it's pretty, it goes with the territory. I mean, it's very self-evident to anyone who has anything to do with animals. Of course, they're living um, sentient beings that can experience pain and suffering and so on. And uh, it's good to have that explicitly recognised in the legislation. Mm. But it won't mean anything if we don't follow through mm. with the uh, uh, appropriate consequences throughout the act. Mm. And what about legal rights for animals? Absolutely, mm. absolutely. I mean, they have the right not to be inflicted with unnecessary pain or suffering, to experience the five freedom and so on, and to be well looked after throughout their lives. And that, that's absolutely fundamental. Mm. That's not actually what happens in practice, though, is it? And if they had independent legal rights, that would have a lot of implications for New Zealand all the wealth in this country that's built on the backs of animals? I think the, the basic um, concept needs to be that they have the right to good lives mm. while they, even if we are using them for economic um, gain, mm. that they, they are not, that they still live in good lives. Mm. Um, that they, you know, that hen can express all their natural behaviour, mm. that they're not kept confined in cruel cages, um, you know, that they, they're kind of very fundamental, that they're not being bred to um, uh, be suffer all their lives because their, their leg bones are too weak, mm. for example, to support their own weight. Mm. There are all sorts of things that go on that should not be happening. Mm. And um, we need to be able to give them that protection in the law. Mm. New Zealand could actually lead the world in having the best animal welfare laws in the world, but unfortunately there doesn't really seem to be any motivation in Parliament to do that, apart from among the Greens. Um, we absolutely have an opportunity to promote ourselves as world leaders. Um, it, uh, what I think is a real saying is that I keep hearing people saying that we are world leaders. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we're not, no. because although we give a lot of recognition to what's needed um, for animal, good animal welfare, mm -hmm. we don't follow it through. Mm -hmm. uh, we allow two million exemptions, as I've talked about. We have factory farming. We um, we do not monitor and enforce compliance with the law. There's all sorts of gaps in our legislation that we need to stop. Mm. We, we also do things like we allow um, exploitation of animals purely for entertainment. I consider that to be completely unacceptable, mm. that animals should suffer for our entertainment. Mm. There should be no suffering involved. Mm. And um, so there's a lot that we could do to really become world leaders. Mm. But I mean, we need to do this because animal products are the back of our backbone of our prosperity as a country. Mm -hmm. And we cannot afford to allow our reputation to be tainted 
by allowing provision for cruel practices to exist in some parts of the um, industry. Mm. The Greens support creating an independent commissioner of animal welfare. What would that person do? Um, what we would like to see is an independent commission for animal welfare. And the, the reason why it needs to be independent from the Ministry of Primary mm. Industry because the Ministry of Primary Industries has a vested interest in promoting um, the interest of people who stand to gain economically from um, the use of animals. And so the only way that we can ensure that there's a voice that absolutely says what is best for animals is to have an independent commissioner that would um, develop the codes of welfare, monitor, be responsible for monitoring them, reporting back and, enforcement and assist with enforcement. And, and in that way we can have, um, be sure that there is not a con conflict of interest between the economic gain to be um, from the, their use and the right, their right to not be exploited and suffer unnecessarily. The Greens have got an amendment that you are hoping to introduce in Parliament tomorrow. What's that about? Well, the bill is the Psychoactive Substances Bill and to, um, at the moment uh, it is very likely that the safety of these substances will involve some testing on animals. Mm. My amendment to the bill will rule out all of the information from animal testing so because we do not consider that to be necessary in order to assess their safety. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen lots of evidence of uh, non-animal tests that are very sophisticated tests uh, that do a better job of predicting the safety of drugs than animal tests will do so. Animal testing is extremely involves a lot of suffering mm -hmm. and we should try and avoid it wherever possible and we do not consider it necessary for the testing of recreational drugs. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that tomorrow. Thank you Mojo. The footage you're seeing is of a wax eye called Cheapy. My parents' cat caught her. I rescued her and took her home. Her body was the size of a teaspoon and she had two very long skinny legs. She had no visible wings and she'd lost lots of her feathers when the cat caught her. I tucked her up and kept her warm, but nobody thought she would survive. I couldn't believe she was still alive the next morning. I fed her and kept her warm and she thrived. She was a real fighter. Every time I came near, she checked at me to let me know she was hungry. She had a varied diet of fruit, damp bread and mince. Cheapy was with me for five weeks. She ended up living in the bottom of the shower so that she could have flying practice in a confined area. She then taught herself to fly. She became very tame and would sit on my shoulder when I was at the computer. Cheapy also liked to cuddle into my neck and enjoyed being stroked gently on the top of her head. After five weeks, we took her to a bird rescue centre. I then found out that we'd done everything wrong in caring for her. We should have taken her to a bird rescue centre straight away so she could socialise with other wax eyes. The diet we fed her was also wrong. She should have been having nectar, which is what she would eat in the wild. Also, one of her feet was curled over. She needed to spend lots of time perching to correct that. Now, to tell us the proper way to look after rescued wild birds, I'm joined by Lynn MacDonald of the New Zealand Bird Rescue Charitable Trust. Kia ora Lynn, welcome to the programme. Thank you. What does the New Zealand Bird Rescue Charitable Trust do? We rehabil rehabilitate all New Zealand birds. It's um, giving them a second chance at life. Mm -hmm. And you've been going since 1984, that's a pretty big commitment. It is, it's a long time. Um, Pam and Colleen started it off originally and mm. I've been doing it for 27 years now. Oh. Mm. And how did you first get involved in rescuing birds? Um, I always grew up with animals and I got to the stage in my life where I was a single mother with four children. Tried working, couldn't do it, didn't know where the children were all the time and what they were up to. So I um, decided I had to give back to the community somehow and I went along to a um, bird rescue talk at the Calston Community Centre and here I am 27 years later. Wow! <laughs> <laughs>
I bet you never thought that going to one talk would lead to that long a commitment. No, not at all. Mm. And you, the organisation was bequeathed a property that must have actually really helped you. Recently, yes, about mm. six years ago from the Joc Jocelyn Grattan left it to us and it's mm -hmm. wonderful because it's a really big property which is what we need for all the birds we take on. Mm. Mm. And you rescue and rehabilitate all New Zealand birds? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. The only bird that we have a bit of difficulty taking in is roosters because the council won't let us have them on the property. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what range of birds do you see? What are the most common species? Um, I live in West Auckland and we operate in West Auckland, so most, the most common one we get is ducks, of course, so that's our major, major um, bird that we deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what other sorts of birds? Well, we deal with everything. We get a lot of seabirds. Our first bird in, in our centre at Green Bay was a uh, royal albatross. Oh. And we get lots of, lots of um, native birds, lots of non-native birds. Mm -hmm. mm. And so what do you do when a bird's first brought to you? Um, we may have to take it to the vet if it needs that. We have a vet on board which helps us out at um, vet doctors and um, they're really good with um, illnesses and things. If the simple breaks and we can fix it ourselves, we, we will bandage it up, but generally it goes off to the vet. What are the main injuries that the birds you see have? Uh, we have a lot of um, car problems because a lot of our birds are in the city, so hit by cars. Mm -hmm. We have um, injuries like birds getting stuck in fences, wooden paling fences. Mm -hmm. We have children at kindergartens chasing and hitting birds. Mm. Um, so a lot of human things come into play there as well. So mm. we oh, have that must be depressing to see. Oh, it is, yes, but mm. it's right across the range. Of course, we have the cats and the dogs injuries as well. Mm. So. Mm. Mm. And so what do you do when a bird's first brought to you? You check whether the bird needs to go to the vet? Is that the first thing? To uh, that's virtually the first thing we do, yes. We have to assess it and decide what's going to happen. Mm. And then what do you do after that? Uh, well, what, once it's been to the vet, we do the re rehabilitation um, effort on it. We keep it in, in a centre. We have to keep it warm. We use heat pads. Um, we have to feed it. Often birds um, are force-fed. They're not. They don't automatically start eating on their own. Mm. So we have to force-feed them with um, like tube feeding and um, hand feeding. Wood pigeons, for instance, that have hit windows. They get concussions and they don't oh. don't know how to feed themselves anymore. So you have to hand feed them. Mm. Mm. And how often do they need to be fed? Well, we have birds coming in from all ranges, and we've got little tiny birds in, which are like fantails and swallows. They need feeding every ten minutes. And oh, you're kidding! Yeah, no, wow. Every ten minutes throughout the day, mm. and then we get um, bigger birds, which are every half an hour to every hour mm. and then we get other birds that we're feeding like three times a day depending on their size. Mm. Mm. And does someone need to feed them during the night as well? No, we're very lucky there. We can <laughs> sleep at night time like <laughs> them. <laughs> and what sort of a mortality rate is there? Can you manage to save most of the ones brought to you or are some of them just too badly injured or traumatised? No, we save probably two thirds of what, what we get in. Mm. So. Yeah. It's quite a quite a good success. That is good, really. yeah. Mm. And how long are they staying with you on average? On average, probably a couple of weeks generally, most mm. of our birds. So a lot of our baby birds stay with us for a few months because, of course, we wait until they get to be um, young adults before mm. we're able to release them. So. Mm. Mm. And are all the birds, are they in cages at your centre or how do you keep them? Uh, we keep a lot of them in um, boxes. We have uh, white plastic boxes that we keep them in. We have to keep heat on them, so mm. we've got um, electric pads underneath them. And um, the white plastic boxes are easy to clean. We have a netting sort of system on the top for easy breathing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. mm. How many birds would you take in a year about? We're taking between four and 5,000 a year, closer oh. to 5,000 than the four. Mm. Oh. And so how many would be in the centre at one time? Um, well, some days we get 50 people bringing birds in, so we get 50 birds in a day. Wow. And most days we probably, in the spring and summer, we average at least 30 birds a day. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, that's our particularly busy time. Mm. Mm. So you'd need lots of volunteers to help with cleaning and feeding? Yeah, we've got a lot of um, volunteers now that help us out. They're really lovely people. They do a really good job and we're always looking for more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if people want to help you, what are the best things they can provide? Would that be money and time? Are there any other things you need? Um, we have a wish list that we have out and um, a lot of that is the different food we use. We use a, an immense amount of um, tin kitten food mm -hmm. and everyone's surprised at that. They think, oh, we must have lots of cats, but it's not cats, it's the birds. <laughs> They're actually basically meat eating, so you're having to um, replicate that. So the kitten food carries um, vitamins and um, uh, essential um, stuff in there for them that makes a good food for them. So mm -hmm. that's what we use mm -hmm. the majority of. And what else is on your wish list? Oh, things like frozen peas and corn because the wood pigeons eat that and frozen berries and um, we, have, we have a need for pharynx um, and we need soap powder for instance. We can do up to nine loads of washing a day, every day. Oh. Mm. <laughs> so. And you had a white tui once, didn't you? Ah, yes, we did, and we discovered what's been going on with that. Birds in different areas eat different things, and you get different colours. Oh. And there seemed to be a bit of a problem with the tuis that particular year. Mm. And quite a few were coming through white, mm. and the ones that we kept on and kept them longer, like closer for closer to a year, they actually developed black, black feathers again. So it was a deficiency somewhere in the food line, mm -hmm. food chain somewhere. Right. Mm. Thanks very much, Lynn. Oh, you're welcome. A woman who became a vegetarian at the age of eight because she didn't want to eat animals anymore has devoted her life to rescuing animals in Jakarta. Femke Denha started volunteering at animal shelters when she was 15. She later took six months off school to work full-time at an East Kalimantan Orangutan Rescue Reserve. She went on to establish the Jakarta Animal Aid Network, which lobbies against the illegal trade in endangered and rare animals and also works in wildlife conservation and animal adoption. The Jakarta Animal Aid Network raises awareness about unjust practices such as travelling dolphin shows and dancing monkeys. It also rescues and rehabilitates exploited animals. Commissioners in Miami-Dade County are expected to approve a plan to keep unwanted dogs and cats out of the county's death chamber. Animal Services Department Director Alex Muno has drawn up a blueprint to achieve a no-kill objective. This will be achieved by a $20 million budget increase funded by a property tax rise supported by almost 65% of voters in a non-binding straw vote last November. The average property owner will pay an extra $20 a year to fund the plan. Cardiff University scientists are asking members of the public to help reduce the numbers of animals killed on roads by reporting animal bodies they see. The scientists hope that by building up a map of roadkill hotspots they can cut wildlife casualties. The project, called Operation Splatter, asks people to sign up as Splatter Spotters and send their findings via social media. American Jody Deagle has set up Maine in Heaven, a not-for-profit animal therapy organisation using her four miniature horses. The animals are the size of golden retrievers. The three older horses have all passed the evaluation process for Pet Partners, an American organisation that determines whether animals and handlers are ready to visit schools, hospitals and other organisations. Jody and 43 volunteers meet every weekend to train both horses and volunteers. Jody says it's sometimes easier to train the animals than the humans. Animals Australia is continuing to attract attention for its campaign against factory farming with retailer Coles. Factory farming advocates are criticising Animals Australia, unhappy at the graphic images used in its campaigns. But animal advocates are praising the group for the publicity given to the cruelty of factory farming. 
American Lori Lori Moore has joined with others to find homes for America's millions of unwanted dogs. Millions of dogs are euthanized in America because humans no longer want them and there are not enough new homes for the animals. Lori and others adopt dogs slated for euthanasia and foster them before transporting them to new homes. Now, here are the five key points you need to know from this week's program. Lobby political parties to create the role of animal welfare spokesperson and to write animal welfare policies. Support the establishment of an independent commissioner of animal welfare. Make your views about animal welfare known to your local MP, Minister for Primary Industries Nathan Guy and Prime Minister John Key. Keep rescued birds warm and feed them. Take them to a bird rescue organisation that can give them specialist care. That's our programme for this week. Join me next week when we'll talk to Auckland councillor Cathy Casey about the sad fate of thousands of dogs who end up at the pound. We'll also hear from Crown solicitor Simon Moore about why penalties for animal cruelty are so low. Thanks for watching. Kakite Anor.